Rollingstones.com and Rollingstone.com, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, one of the uh, proud bands from Wales here. We've got, uh, uh, why don't you introduce yourselves? I'm here with the Manic Street Preachers. I'm Nicky Wire, I play bass. I'm James Bradfield, I'll play guitar and sing for the Manic Street Preachers. <laughs> so, uh, how's the tour been going? Um, it's uh, been a couple of days, and... Uh well, we've been here two weeks, but we've only done three gigs. Yeah, I James unfortunately lost his voice. So yeah, is everything uh what what happened? Just a little little too much screaming or Um no, I just kind of just woke up one morning and lost my voice. <laughs> Perhaps I decided that I can't smoke or drink anymore because I'm too old. You think the know. rock and roll lifestyle's getting uh c catching up to you maybe? Yeah, or? yeah perhaps <laughs> it's kind of just perhaps it's just a sign of aging, you know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I had laryngitis, but perhaps just not quite as strong as it used compounded to be. By the compounded by kind of a bad male lifestyle <laughs> traits. <laughs> but kind of, um, you know, we missed two gigs, so I kind of oh, that's, that's not trying to make up for it now. So you're going to try to, uh, I mean, how did you, uh, how'd you get it back? Just like no talking, lots of honey, no, lots of OJ, what? <laughs> no, I went to the doctors the day after, and uh, he put me on a kind of, uh, put me on a course of steroids. So I kind of uh, got a bit of an athlete thing going on at the moment. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, so were you guys, you guys pretty excited to be here in the uh, United States at all? And, uh, I mean, the last time you were here, you were touring with Oasis, and you were playing to your... I mean, you normally play stadium-sized crowds when you're out in Wales, or, I mean, basically in the UK or anywhere else, but out here you're playing the Metro, which is kind of obviously smaller. But uh, what's, what's it like for you? Well, it's just really strange coming back here because we played here with... Um, we played here in 1991, 1992. 1992. Yeah, on Gen Generation Terrorist album, so the last time we played here... The last time we played you, Richie was in the band, so yeah. it's quite, even on that level, it's quite, it's very weird, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this, where we played you the first time, was the only gig on tour anyone turned up, really. It's probably because my brother brought all his friends, because he was living here, but it was, yeah, that was a pretty disastrous tour, but this one was, James can't remember, he was absolutely so pissed the night before that it's a complete blur. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were telling me earlier that um, you actually filmed one of your old, older uh, videos here. Um, we did. We did Roses in the Hospital, yeah. Um, Jim did a lot on the beach, didn't he? In yeah. Actually, Lake Michigan, yeah. yeah. John yeah, over that way. Yeah, six o'clock in the morning, if I remember right. <laughs> <laughs> and it wouldn't, well, there's a tiny little bit of it in the video there is. Believe me, trust me. Just clips and such. I've actually got a video at the gig we did, you. Yeah. I've got a really dodgy bootleg video of the gig we did here in 92 actually which is really good because I at that time I used to get a pillow from the hotel as like an Alice Cooper trip and rip the pillow up and cover <laughs> the crowd with all the feathers so <laughs> if anybody had asthma back then they had to get out of the gig oh jeez <laughs> but it was good oh, well that's pretty wow I didn't know that that was an interesting fact to know about that with the whole Chicago connection and your brother living out here is, is he still here or is he no he came home he had enough finally I think uh. He had enough of American women. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you guys like uh, have any expectations with this uh, small tour that you've got going to get a bigger American fan base? Because there hasn't been a lot of promotion of your recent material out here until this one, now that you're on Virgin. Well, there's been none. I mean, uh, it's been a long time kind of litigation trying to get off Sony anyway. You know, with everything was go was absolutely not done anything with and Holy Bible was never released out here so right. we've been trying to get off Sony for a long time and you know this is the best uh, most successful tour we've ever done and unfortunately we had to cancel a couple you know played to a couple of thousand in Toronto and then Boston New York were sold out and should be seven or eight hundred here tonight so for us it's kind of building a fan base I think well that's good that's yeah. good I mean it's um it's too bad that not a lot I mean it, it, the trouble with a lot of UK bands coming to the U.S., a lot of them kind of have a fear of touring the U.S. because the American audiences are so different from the U.K. audiences, I think. And it's not just that. It's just starting again. And, uh, you know, like you said, you know, we can play to on New Year's Eve in, in Wales. We're going to be playing to 55,000 people. And when you do that, and it's a lot easier than coming over here. And playing more intimate. Uh, just, you know, especially because we've been going 10 years. So, you know, you know we can go to to Scandinavia and pay to 10,000 people go to Japan we can go anywhere except America so are you kind of surprised at the fan base that you've got out here I am yeah I've been pleasantly surprised so far actually you know every there's no disasters you know Minneapolis perhaps tomorrow even there we're going to get 500 people which is quite good for us uh, anybody following you around tour yet have you uh, found any people outside that may have followed you since New York or um, <laughs> no there was a couple of people came over from Jap Japan 
But uh, kind of uh, after two gigs got cancelled, they fucked off back home. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people came from Wales to watch us in New York. <laughs> we cancelled the gig. <laughs> so well it, was a, it was a long and expensive trip from them. It was interesting when when I had come to uh, set this up. Somebody thought I was one of your friends because I was wearing the uh, was the forest. Yeah, he just, he the forest to shirt. Check you out. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that fucking prick in the forest top? <laughs> so you guys were um, you guys were back here in the U.S. when um, it was announced with the uh, Mercury Music Prize, and uh, this had, this wasn't the first time that you've been nominated for it. And obviously this year it went to Talvin Singh. And you guys were like, according to the odds, you know, you were three to one odds to to get that. And uh, I mean, have you heard the Talvin Singh album? What do you think of it? I mean, well, we were only favourites because we were the biggest selling. So you know, that's just bookmakers for you playing it safe. You know, mm-hmm. anybody with any brains knew that the Mercury always kind of goes to a real left field alternative album. And you know, I think it's better that way. It's yeah. the last thing we wanted to do. I know. It's well, I'm a very competitive person, and I like winning. But it's just one thing we didn't want to win. It's good. Just yeah, it's a good sport, though. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's just. It's just. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even go. James went. Yeah. Okay. James went because Tom Jones was there and he wanted a bit of a drink. And that's right. And you d- recently did a collaboration with Tom for his uh, for his upcoming album. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, lots of people did like you know collaborations with him, and I um yeah I just sang in a, a kind of an old old Elvis song with him. Which one? Uh, uh, it's called "You're yeah, Right, I'm Left, She's Gone." <laughs> and I just kind of <coughs> I want to do it on the level that just. I want to actually see, kind of like, you know, what it's like. You know, I actually want to see what it's like to see Tom singing in front of you. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's any trick involved, you know what I mean? Kind of like, and it was right. pretty, pretty amazing, actually. Well, yeah, I'm a huge Tom Jones fan myself. Yeah. I'm not kind of, I'm not a huge Tom Jones fan in terms of, you know, the quiche quality of it. Or just oh, like, yeah. You know, I actually kind of quite take his voice quite seriously. Oh, yeah, you for know. a man in his 60s. But yeah, yeah I mean, kind of he came in and sang it, and he'd been out till 6 o'clock in the morning drinking and smoking, <laughs> and he just hit the spot straight away. So I kind of, I thought if I could be like him, I've had to give up my drink and my smoking oh yeah. until <laughs> at the age of 30. So he's, he's, he's the king. <laughs> until, until. Uh, yeah. so I feel like I'm a new man because I've given up drinking and smoking <laughs> for three days. <laughs> I did not, I did not, I swear my life up that if anything, I didn't have anything to drink. Nothing at all, not one, not one, that's weird. Okay. Hope, <laughs> hope die of, <laughs> hope die of heart attack. <laughs> He's desperate to stop being spoken. So, I mean, is that when you when you guys were growing up in, you know, a little Welsh town and all that, and Tom Jones was around back then as well, and it was kind of like, was he one of your heroes back then almost? like? Not really. I think when you're younger, you kind of like stuff that's kind of dis- dis- so disassociated from where you come from. You know, I kind of, you kind of, when you're young, you kind of want to escape the things of where you come from. It's right. only when you get a bit older that kind of you start realizing kind of the things that are actually around you, you like know, that, the clash. Like yeah, I mean, we were more punk orientated and stuff when we were young. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's, how, that's how I noticed in the early days when I was back in college and I had seen Generation Terrorists. And uh, um, back then, it seemed like a lot of the press was just passing you off as like another sort of glam Guns N' Roses style. And other people were calling you a very important band. And you just kept going. And, uh, you know, things, things have changed. And now, you know, the stu- I, can, I can tell the lyrics are still very... Uh, pounding, I guess I, it's the best way I could I could put it. But um, obviously, the sound is has toned down a bit. Um, is, is that a is that a sign of aging, possibly? Or I, I, I mean, kind of yeah. I mean, kind of for a start, I mean, kind of you know, we always wanted to be kind of we never wanted to be a band that became a caricature, you know, of what we were before. I mean, kind of I mean, kind of a lot of our favorite bands like the Clash, you know, from their first album to London Calling. <laughs> They managed to actually, you know, transcend, you know, the form they worked in originally and become something else. Mm-hmm. You know, they, p- they went from being a punk band to a classic rock and roll band. And I think, you know, kind of just as you get older, you may call it mature, but I think you just get better at doing things. You get better at writing music. You get better at writing lyrics. You get better at just playing your instruments, just mm-hmm. really boring, rudimentary things, but it has a really kind of like, you know, massive effect on what you do. That's the only thing about those changes is just get uglier yeah well uh, this is the first time i've really seen you guys so i can't really say you've gotten uglier or better or anything like that although i noticed that uh i mean obviously you're very uh very mellowed out now as opposed to like well i noticed that you still have the feather boa up on stage and uh the mark of respect yeah back to the old days and everything so and i mean i noticed with a lot of the songwriting as well there's a lot of um i mean to get back to the whole Wales and the whole welsh um background that that's been going on it's like there's a lot of pride in in where you're from and i noticed that there's a lot of other bands that are coming out of wales as well that are sort of 
bringing that as well, like with stereophonics and super furry animals and catatonia. And do you feel that you're trying to put, like, finally put whales on the map, get going? Because I know that you actually were, you were interested. I mean, I, I read somewhere that you were interested in uh, getting involved in politics at one time. One day, yeah, I'll be the, li- I'll be the king of Wales one day. Oh, is that so? <laughs> uh, maybe one day I'll be, might be, I might go into politics. Yeah, it's just I got such a dodgy past, and you, know, you can s- see all the local papers with me in a picture of the feather boa and a leopard print dress, <laughs> and it's like, will you elect this person? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know. Well, hey, it's, you know, it's good coming from where we come from. We just, us, we're happy. We we are. It's not a big nationalist thing, and we're not nationalists at all. We're just okay. happy to be coming where we are. Hmm. And I notice also with um, other, uh, specifically with like the, f- the super furry animals and with Catatonia, I mean, they also, um, they sing in Welsh. I mean, yeah. and it's, it's a very interesting language. I mean, do any of you guys know that? I mean, have you brought up with it? Try to maybe even sing a song in Welsh as a B-side? No, we weren't allowed to speak Welsh at school. We had to learn German and French. So is it Wales is a tiny country, but it's incredibly fucked up and divided, you know. And um, the language is a, it's almost become a political issue. It's hard. You know, if everybody learned it at birth and we were bilingual, it'd be a much happier nation, I think. But it's all messed up. You think the Welsh? But I mean, to be honest, you, I'd never sing in Welsh anyway because, you know, I, we're internationalists and we want to reach as many people as possible. So you know, we don't want to be like the Gypsy Kings or something. <laughs> <laughs> so wh- when you say you want to be nationalist, I mean I notice with internationalist, a lot of internationalist, not nationalist. When you want to, um, when when you when you choose the material that you've written about, I mean there's a lot of very, um, like the song like um, if you tolerate this, obviously with a Spanish Civil War influence and other songs, um, you know songs about the past, songs about Richie, songs that are deep about various um, just things that are personal to you and also very political. I mean. Uh, do you, I mean, what, what, what inspires you to write things like that, obviously? I mean, it's, it's just because I'm really intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> do you do a lot of reading? Do you, like, uh, pick the paper I up every day? I went to university and I did politics in university, so just something that stayed with me. Um, you know, I am interested in politics. It's just one of the, those boring things. You know, most musicians are interested in their amps and plectrums mm-hmm. but and guitars, and I'm, I'm not. Do you find that, uh, I mean, most most of the subject matter stays with a very European... Uh, uh it's hard, yeah, it's hard to transcend American politics because the class, class structure is completely different. I mean, you've basically got an underclass and then, you know, not much in between. It's not like a working class. The working class is more the sort of Bruce Springsteen, sort mm-hmm. of blue-collar type, yeah. you know. So it's, it's difficult. I don't think once James was on we were compared to th- well the working man's Leonard Skinhead or something <laughs> like that. something like that so it's, it's really tricky you know I, I do think we we are quite European in our things and I well I've noticed a couple of songs though I mean have a little bit of that U.S. Plenty um, of anti-American songs. Yeah, I mean, songs. Like, well, a, a song that I particularly like was from the Holy Bible. I really like that, it's If White America song. Told the Truth. That yeah, it's a fantastic record. Yeah, it's absolutely I love that cool. album, actually, and it's too bad it wasn't released here in the U.S. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I just I I don't know I when I when I heard it I was I was really Im- I mean I got it a few years ago after I had heard everything must go and then I just went ahead and I I picked up the uh, the back catalog I got the first three albums and when I listened to the Holy Bible it just had a very you know every it was like just a very you know a meaty album it just had a lot of gut to it there was yeah. a lot of a lot of stuff in it and um, it's been it's been like that for a w- I mean I, w- like a song like if white America told the truth and. Um, other ones like Revol, which is obviously um <laughs> in a different stratosphere. Revol, I mean, no one knows what that lyric is about. Yeah, uh, even, do you s- even Richie. Do now, do you now do you know what your lyrics are about? Sometimes yeah. you write them and you're like, "What did I say back then?" Or no, I can basically remember most things. I mean, a certain like Revol, Richie came out of it and even said, "I don't really know what the fuck is about." But um, if White America is a brilliant, brilliant dissection of kind of certain American values. You know, it's not to say we're particularly anti-American, but I think everybody mm-hmm. has a duty to write about things they feel about. And sometimes when you're bombarded with certain cultures, then you feel you've got to kind of react against it. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, probably a good job it was never released. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't released in Italy either, as well, because the, the Catholic stuff. Was it, the, was it the cover, possibly, with the, uh, the, the three photos? or No, it's just because it was called the Holy Bible and, you know, 
heavily Catholic. <laughs> yeah, you can't go to the Vatican with that. that. Quite right. Yeah. Quite right. So, and uh, so I mean, and your album titles also seem to have a very um, significance to each album. I mean, when when I first heard "Everything Must Go," I mean, I, I realized that was because you were entering a new a new stage, which is being a trio, and. Um, and then with, thi- with w- w- are you trying to say something with this is my truth, tell me yours? I mean, is this a call to for other listeners to sort of you know learn about what you're talking about? Or yeah, the title's meant you know wha- when we came up with the title, it's a, it's a quote from a Welsh politician it is who set up the National Health Service in the UK after the Second World War, and um, he's a really true socialist, so it's just uh, um, nicking it one of some of his words as inspiration really. It's just my contemplation on life, really. Lyrically. Lyrically. <laughs> <laughs> Have you um, been writing any new material, trying to find some new aspects to cover, or just, uh, you know, what little things come up that suddenly um, <coughs> sparks a, a new song to be written? <coughs> no, it's kind of like, you know, we've written, like, say, like, seven, six new songs. Um, but, kind of, I just, f- you know, we've been, like, we've been touring for, like, over a year. And um, I think we just kind of feel as if we want to disassociate ourselves from the recent past. And it's really hard for us to kind of get anything new going in the state of mind we're in at the moment. So, like, you know, we're in that kind of, like, twilight zone where we can feel something new coming, but we haven't actually got a chance to capitalize on it because we're touring and stuff. There's some good songs you've written already. It's just that there's no, not a real direction, is there? No, there isn't, no. I mean, no, we knew that we know that kind of we got to put ourselves in an environment and actually just get away from anything else that's connected with being in a band, you know. <coughs> but um, but first, we've got to have a massive break from actually being yeah. in a band, too. So. You, well, you've been touring for this album for over a year now. Not many people in the U.S. realize that this was r- this album was released in Europe and in the U.K. way yeah, back in it's September. It's exactly just over a year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, if you, go another, if you go another six months, you might be Metallica, because I think they toured for their album, like, oh, for well, about a year and a well half. We've been to- touring over a year now, you know, so we are Metallica. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, how much longer do you think you guys uh, are going to you know, like be putting out albums? I mean, do you feel you got like you still have the urge to to put out a couple more and just keep keep the keep the blood flowing, keep the lyrics coming out? Yeah, we can all obviously you know feel much closer to the end than we did mm-hmm. in the first yeah. album. <laughs> more closer to the end than the start. Yeah, but you know, um, you know, kind of definitely feel as if like you know it's got to frame everything off. I mean, kind of like, actually feel as, I actually feel we haven't made our London call in. He doesn't feel as if he's made his, you know, the Beatles, the White Album. Mm-hmm. Or your Sergeant like Peppers or, yeah. Yeah, you know, so kind of like, you know, we still kind of got a lot of things that we, in our own minds, which we think might be perfect to actually achieve, you know. Mm. So we're going to be taking this and putting it on the internet. I mean, do you guys use the internet no. very often? No. <laughs> you, uh, I take it you've been asked that many times already. No, which is Sean, the drummer, is... is well, he's got millions of computers, so he probably hear me, but he I don't know if he ever uses them. He knows how to use them. He's incredibly intelligent in that sphere, but me and James are just Luddites. We're still on an abacus, me and James. Mm. My wife does it. She's She surfs a lot of the internet and all that, so I just bob in now and again and have a look. Okay. Well, let's hope that uh, you know when once we tape the show tonight and once we put this interview out there, I we bet can... you're going to have lots of people tuning into it. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're just you know we're hoping that uh, something like this can get you guys going in the U.S. Because I I mean it'll be you know, pers- from a personal perspective I'd really hope that you guys got. I a think lot of America exposure. is still is the last challenge for us, you know, deep in our heart of hearts. Although we're tired and everything else, you know, there's so much stuff I like about America which I've yet to discover. You know, through television, like Larry Sanders is my favorite program of all time, and Fraser, and I'm just waiting to come across these people in the street, really. Right. Not the big fat ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, well, thanks a lot, guys. Um, I appreciate the uh, the time out that you've taken to uh, do this. I know it's been a little, you know, you're trying to get so many cities in so many days, but uh, uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for coming to uh, rollingstone.com and tunes.com. I'm here with the Manic Street Preachers. And uh, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>